Tuesday evening. Welcome to Spicer and Company. I'm Sean Spicer. And I'm Lindsay Keith. Well, Sean, let's get right to our top stories tonight. Mass arrests in Minnesota where a second night of violence has erupted over the deadly shooting of Dante Wright. And police arresting more than 50 protesters and looters, some of who attacked police while a TV reporter was forced to flee on air. Watch this. And as we were filming, this happened. A very tense uh, standoff between protesters and police. And as you can hear, several gunshots. Behind those cars. Now! Now! All right, meanwhile, the veteran police officer who shot Dante Wright has now resigned after she allegedly confused her gun for a taser. The police chief, Tim Gannon, has also stepped down tonight, Sean. Yeah, plus there's a lot of other breaking news. Uh, you know, we've been talking about this all day. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's yeah. one of the three that people get. It's the one that you only need one of. The CDC actually is pausing it now over reports of potentially dangerous but very rare blood clots. And, uh, and also going on here in the nation's capital, the Biden administration continues to ramp up this pitch that it's making for so-called infrastructure. As Democrats, check this out. This is, I, I, we've talked about this a lot, but, but now it's not just redefining immigration, I mean infrastructure. They're now asking that immigration yeah. be put in this bill. I mean, this is getting crazier by the day. First, we changed the definition of what infrastructure is. Now we're saying that we're actually going to do infrastructure, excuse me, immigration in the infrastructure bill. I don't know why they're even doing a budget, because they should just do it all right now. Just I mean, add it in the infrastructure. Add it in there, it's for just humans, yeah. so just throw it I in don't, there. By the end of this week, like what is considered infrastructure mm. is going to be completely different than the week that we started. Oh, absolutely. And, and when you change the term, Sean, to your point, you can throw anything in there uh, and when you're expanding things, because why not? Yeah, why not? But it, 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 the thing that I find so fascinating is after four years of hearing about lying and and exaggerating you literally have people talking about changing the definition of words right. of words and no one thinks that's a problem because well, we're evolving Sean that's we're evolving why. yeah we're evolving in like the matter of a week but the idea and we're gonna talk about this later in the show I mean people are now saying child care is infrastructure yeah like at some point someone just goes no it's not if you want to have a discussion about child care have a discussion about child care but this is insane and the idea that the press corps is looking at it going, okay, good point, we'll just change the definition. <laughs> that, what, what is going on? These same people who call me liars all the time are now sitting around going, okay, well, we got a new definition of infrastructure. Oh, change it again today. And no one thinks that's an issue? Well, the thing, and I've said this before, but that really bothers me, and I just don't understand the strategy from the left here, if they would strictly do an infrastructure bill, it would pass through Congress probably yeah, pretty easily. But they know that, and that's the problem, is that so then attach everything to it. It's like a Christmas tree just hanging more ornaments on. But here's the question I have. What happens when you want to do a child care bill down the road? Correct. You go, well, you can't because that's, that's infrastructure. We've already redefined it all. If everything is infrastructure, then it's going to be very hard to go in the other direction. Absolutely. And, and, and they will just change the terms then, Sean. That is the problem with this, you know, strategy. They're just continually moving the goalposts to be whatever they what, want yes. to be. But, but here's the thing. As I said, no one cares. I don't understand. No, number one, the White House, the idea that they're redefining these things is crazy. Two, the media is going along with it. But three, Republicans, get with it. Yeah. Start calling this out. They should be doing this big time because the idea that you can sort of just change the meaning of a word and no one knows, this is getting absolutely ridiculous what's going on in last year. I mean, first, people are changing the definition of all sorts of things and no one seems to care. After four years of hearing about how Trump lied about everything and that everyone in the administration was exaggerating this, not being honest about that, they get to do this yeah. and no one calls it out? Well, Sean, the thing is, they, they do, we talk about this often, but they do a great job of messaging and saying, how can you be against child care, Sean? How could you ever be against that? How could you ever be against COVID? People that need help. And they make a great case for themselves. To your point, Republicans need to step up and speak the truth yeah. and really expose things for what they are. You know, I, I want to pivot for a minute because we were talking about this at the beginning of the show, this violence that's going on. And it's become now far too often that we see this where there's an incident that occurs with police. And, and things get out of control. And in this case, this young man uh, was killed in Minneapolis, or outside Minneapolis, rather. Um, 
And one of the members of Congress tweeted about it, and it, it caught my eye because she was saying that this is inherently racist. Um, and and that, you, you know, I, I, you pointed this out at the beginning, though. The police chief in this, and if you watch the video, the officer um, says, you know, I'm trying to tase him. And, and she clearly, I, I, again, I, we can have a whole discussion about that, yeah. like whether or not how, how bad that got screwed up. I, right? Um, but it, it, is, it is just what is going on on, on policing is, is something that has got to be discussed in America because this member of Congress, as I said, now branding all of this racism. And, and where's this line? Well, I want to bring in Kentucky Republican Senator Rand Paul. So much to break down with him. Senator, thanks for joining us again. Yep, thanks for having me. Um, all right, sir, we just talked about this, that there were 50 protesters arrested last night in Minnesota because of the violence stemming from the killing of this young individual during this traffic stop, right? Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, though, tweeted this. This wasn't an accident. Policing in our country is inherently and intentionally racist. Senator, look, I watched this. I'm not trying to decide, you know, play judge and juror here, but according to the police chief at the time, the officer made a deadly, horrible mistake in how she reacted. But you can hear her saying, I'm going to tase you, I'm going to tase you. I'm not trying to get into uh, whether or not there needs to be more training. That's a discussion that we can have. But the point here is that I feel like We've kind of reached a boiling point where every time there's a mistake now, it's racist as opposed to potentially just a really bad mistake. Do you agree? You know, without making a direct comment about each of these different instances that are happening, I would say in general that I don't think that police are in general are racist. Many of our police chiefs, in fact, probably half of our police chiefs in our major cities are African-American. In many of our big cities, over half of the policemen are African-American. Um, look, when I was attacked by a mob in D.C. with my wife, two out of the three policemen who saved our life that night were African-American. Parts of the mob were African-American. We just need to get beyond thinking that everything's about race. Now, is there a police yeah. misconduct on occasion? Yes, and it should be punished, and we should take care of it. Well, we shouldn't think that every policeman out there is basing their decisions on race. I think that is simplifying this in an incorrect fashion. We also have to understand it's a difficult, life-threatening job where police have to make decisions sometimes. And these people are saying we should defund the police or get rid of the police. I think that's uh, wrongheaded. And you're seeing some cities that have been on fire for months and months. That's what happens when you don't have police. And so I think people need to be very, very careful about this. But at the same time, I don't want to be insensitive to any of these individual cases. I also don't know the details enough to be like a, a juror on a trial for any of the things that have been happening. There's so, so many things going on, and we do need to look at trying to, to make uh, policing better in our country. But we also have to be aware that we're losing police by the hundreds and hundreds in all of our different mm. cities. It's, we're making it such that are we going to have policemen left when we're done with this if we so vilify and categorically say they're, categorically say they're all racist? I think that's a, a very inappropriate thing for her to have said, and she ought to retract it. I agree. Hmm. Senator, I want to shift gears a little bit here. Sean and I were talking about this at the top. The CDC is recommending that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, be paused for now because there's reports of blood clotting. You know, it's this interesting thing right now when there's so much push to for everyone to get the vaccine. What is this going to affect? Is this going to have overall? And also, what effect is it going to have on those on the right who have been hesitant in the first place to trust vaccines? Um, are you concerned about that? I think the main thing is in a free society, each individual assesses their own risk and makes their own decisions. And what medical decisions I make really are nobody else's business. Uh, no one should make me produce papers to say that I've agreed with somebody to have a vaccination. That being said, I'm for the vaccine, particularly for high risk individuals. If you're above 80, above 70, or if you're overweight and above 40, all those people I would consider to be high risk. If you're less than 25, it, death rate from this disease is one in a million. And under age 25, COVID is actually less dangerous than influenza. So the answer is just not one size fits all. So with regard to Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, they're made the same way. They're both used, they use the adenovirus and there have been some complications. If I was 80 years old, I would take the Johnson & Johnson right now. I'd take it. But if I were 25, I probably wouldn't. 
So you see what I mean? You have to assess your risk and the risks. The risks with the vaccine are very tiny, but the risks of being 25 and having a problem are almost non-existent too. Above 80, it's a thousand times more dangerous. So it's probably worth taking even a small risk of a vaccine being a problem. I think it's worth studying. Uh, it's important for people to know Johnson & Johnson and adeno is made with an adenovirus, so is AstraZeneca. They're both reporting a similar problem with bleeding. And so uh, if you're at high risk and it's the one out there, you know, if you're above 70, if you've got other health problems, I'd take whatever vaccine you can get your hands on. If you're younger and don't have any health risk, then it really ought to be your choice. Senator, um, I, I want to ask you something based on kind of what you just said, right? So the the uh, the a lot of folks who are uh, black and brown, who are conservative, are hesitant to take that vaccine, right? Lindsay just mentioned it, but then the White House talked about it today as well. We've asked Dr. Fauci since this show came on to come on this show and to spread his message, right? So far, he's refused. He wanted desperately to go on Rachel Maddow, according to himself, right? He said that. And then today, the White House outlined a plan to convince conservatives to get the vaccine. I want to play you a, a soundbite of what Press Secretary Jen Psaki had to say. Uh, we're also looking for, we've run PSAs on the deadliest catch. We're engaged with NASCAR and country music TV. We're looking for a range of creative ways to get directly connected to white conservative communities. So, Senator, you, you represent a lot of these folks. So, right. Dr. Fauci and, the, and those guys from the government, they don't want to come on Newsmax. They don't want to come on this show to make the case so eloquently as you just did as a medical professional. And yet they, they sort of trivialize this by like, hey, we're going to go down to NASCAR. And then not making a direct case on conservative media, I think, is a failure of this White House. I think if you want people who are skeptical of the vaccine to take it, a couple of things. Tell them, number one, it's their choice in a free society. They're free to make a choice. And through persuasion, try to persuade them to take it. But here's the other thing. You can't lie to us. We're not stupid. And, we're, and the more you lie to us, the more resistant we'll be. If you tell me that an 18-year-old absolutely has to take it the same as an 85-year-old, you are lying to me. And once I know you're lying to me, I will be resistant to believe everything else. This is a disease that is heavily weighted in mortality towards age. And for goodness knows, we should be recommending everybody of a certain age get it. Absolutely, they should be first in line. But we shouldn't be saying it's the same risk factors for young people. And yet many young people will take the vaccine and there are some deaths among young people, but it's very, very rare. And believe it or not, COVID is actually, for young people, less dangerous than the seasonal flu. So we just have to put it in perspective. Once you do that, a lot of people still will line up. The numbers are amazing. Over 70% of those over 75 years old have gotten the vaccine. That is an amazing number. But the other thing Dr. Fauci won't tell you is, a third of the public has antibodies from having gotten this naturally. So we have about a third of the people who've gotten it naturally. We have about a third of the people who've been vaccinated. We are fast approaching a time where the community is going to be protected because of vaccine immunity plus natural immunity. The other thing Dr. Fauci should spend some time telling us, and I'm doing this in every interview, monoclonal antibodies can save your life. But there's a window of time. If you get COVID, and you're developing a bronchitis, you're starting to cough, but you're not yet sick, that's when you have to get the monoclonal antibodies as early as possible. If you wait till you're too sick, they will not give them to you, they don't work, and they actually won't even give you the monoclonal antibodies. But President Trump had the monoclonal antibodies, Chris Christie yeah. got them, so did Giuliani. So there's three Republicans who all took uh, the monoclonal antibodies, survived the disease, right. you can right. too, but people need to know that and it's a disservice that Fauci's going everywhere talking about masks. 80% of people who get the infection have been wearing a mask. The mask is a very right. imperfect, if it works at all, it is very imperfect. The vaccine works, and so do the monoclonal antibodies. Let's, let's, let's try to convince people by telling them the truth. All right. Well, we're getting the truth from Dr. Rand Paul. Senator, thank you for coming back. We really appreciate it. Thank you. 
All right, still ahead, a new day and a new definition from the left of what infrastructure means. You won't believe what they are trying to include in this spending spree disaster that's coming our way. That's next. We are a country awakened to danger and called to defend freedom. Mr. Gorbachev, 